Welcome to the Expired Podcast by Macy Bookout and Natalie Gard. This week's case is on Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom of Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay, so we have gotten your feedback and we really appreciate your constructive criticism because it helps us do our job better. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are going to try a new format this week. Uh, we have like a little board under the camera that kind of just lays stuff out so we can stay in a sequence that makes sense and not like jump back and forth as much as we maybe have before. So uh, please let us know how you like it or you don't. um, And we'll keep trying to make you guys happy. Like, follow, (laughs) share, subscribe, do it all. All the things, please. (laughs) So we're going to go over victims first. We're going to paint the picture of them. Then we are going to go into the story of what happened. You know, the facts. We're going to get into the suspects and how they were caught. Then we are going to get into the evidence. The evidence. Yeah. I have um, bad eyesight, apparently. I do too. It's okay. <laughs> the evidence and then the trial and what happened with the trial. And then we're going to get into any acts that have come out of the case yeah. and any foundations that the families. Uh, of the victims have started because we actually do have like a lot of respect for the families and what they've Definitely. gone through. We don't know. I don't know firsthand what they've gone through, but I feel like by us doing this kind of keeps their loved one alive and yeah, it keeps their story um, in a positive light and just us supporting and the listeners supporting and knowing what the families have started and created mm-hmm. and changes they've made yeah. is um, kind of how we want to start ending the, the episodes so that um, the victims are remembered and celebrated mm-hmm. um, for who they were, not what happened. Exactly. So. All right, let's get into it. So our victims are 21-year-old Shannon Christian and 23-year-old Christopher Newsom. So Chris has been described as uh, really friendly, had lots of friends. He played baseball in high school, and his coach said he could have gone professional if he wanted to. Mm -hmm. Um, He went into carpentry, and that's what he was doing to make money. He was just, you know. Good old working boy. Yeah, good old working boy. Really good guy, though. And Shannon um, worked two jobs. She was really pretty and popular. Um, she was going to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Mm-hmm. Go Vols. <laughs> had, to, had to throw that one out there. <laughs> so this is where all of this takes place, in Knoxville in 2007. Yeah, both of them still lived with their parents, but, you know, just young, young adults mm-hmm. living life, the normal, I would say very normal life for their age. Um, and they had... When this happened, they had only been dating for a few months, but from everything we've read and heard and seen, they were very much in love. Yeah. Like, normal, but probably could have been the one. I feel like the way their families speak about them and their relationship, I feel like they had had met their match with each other. So, Mm -hmm. sweet kids, love story, but Mm -hmm. then terrible things happen it does and i think this is just a reminder that it just could i've said this with the jasmine pace case it could happen to anyone definitely it could happen to anyone so on january 6th of 2007 shannon had worked that day she was on leave from school so she worked um she was gonna go to her friend kara's apartment Uh, get ready and then Chris after he got off work was going to come to the apartments and they were going to go to dinner at a birthday party Uh, one of Shannon's friends was uh, having a birthday party and um, so Shannon gets to Kara's apartment it's the Washington Ridge Apartments in Knoxville she is she's ready but Chris is late (laughs) yeah I mean I feel like I would have been just like her yes Piss. Yeah, like I spent all this time getting ready and now I'm having to wait on you. Mm-hmm. Like just annoyed. Yeah, annoyed. Yeah. That's a good way to say it. Yep. 
So they head to the car to go to dinner and go to, you know, the birthday party. And, you know, Chris is like, you know, trying to win her. I still love you. (laughs) You're so beautiful. Give kisses and kind of make up for being late. And make her feel important. Yeah, exactly. And a little less annoyed, hopefully. Yes. And so she was in her forerunner sitting in the driver's seat. They were going to take her car. And he was standing outside of the car. Probably just flirting with her. Yeah, just standing there and like (laughs) talking to her before they got in the car to leave. All the while, there are four men in the parking lot, and they are watching them. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And basically put a gun to Chris's head and ultimately end up tying them up and putting them in the back seat of her vehicle and then driving the vehicle to... um, one of the boys, one of the men's homes. Yes. Um, it was on Chipman Street, and it was near a waste management plant. There were some railroad tracks near it, mm-hmm. you know, part of the city. And so, yeah, um, both Chris and Shannon were brutally beaten. They were raped. They were sodomized and had chemical burns. Um, the worst kind of. I don't even. Uh, I... Yeah, I think this is where we say trigger warning because a mm-hmm. lot of what we're about to talk about is um, heinous. I mean, they're just it's evil. Yes, and bad. So yeah, trigger warning. Yes, um, click away if we, yeah if any of this really really bothers you. Um, so Chris was actually found the next day on January seventh. He was found near railroad tracks. Someone working on. Yeah, a train conductor Mm -hmm. actually spotted a body by the railroad tracks and called it in. And um, the, I believe, was a sheriff Sheriff. showed up and was actually able to identify the body immediately because it, it was Chris's body. And Chris and the sheriff's son actually grew up playing baseball together. And he said that he knew it was him right away because of his eyes. Mm that Chris had very distinct eyes. Um, Obviously a nightmare call to Chris's parents. Um, And he had been shot three times. Yes. um, One being in the back, the next being in the neck, and then the fatal shot, which was execution style in his head. Mm -hmm. Um, He did not have shoes on. Right. They he his was shoes in and socks. only a t-shirt and his underwear. Right. Um, he had chemical burns as well from a cleaning agent bleach, basically, to try and get rid of any evidence. evidence. Um, his sock was shoved in his mouth, and the shoestring from his shoes was wrapped around to keep the sock in place. He was barefoot walking on a rail track with all that gravel and sticks. And, and with it, they put a dog leash on him. They put a dog leash on him to lead him. Evil beyond comprehension. Like, beyond comprehension. Like, I just, Ooh. I don't get it. No, no. You ever get sick after we record these podcasts? Sometimes, yes. Oh my this God. one will definitely be one of them. Um, oh man, yeah. So this was the day after January 7th and, um, it was kind of the day that everything kicked off because Shannon had called before she went out Mm -hmm. and was like, I'm going to be home tonight, you know, yeah, to her parents, to her parents. And, um, but basically like, don't wait up on me yeah. kind of, but I'll, I'll be, I'm coming home tonight. Right. And then she, they missed the birthday party. So sus was already up and that's when they kind of alerted everyone. And, and then they found the body, like it was just missing. Oh shoot. We need to tell somebody mm-hmm. and bam, his body was found. Where is Shannon? So they find her vehicle. Um, and they were actually able to get in touch with the cell phone carrier and find the last known location mm-hmm. of her cell phone. Um, and that's what led to them finding her vehicle. Inside the vehicle, it was obvious that 
they had been taken because the drive like the front seats of the vehicle were pushed away back like it, it didn't fit her her or chris's like body type and size mm-hmm. um and they also found an envelope inside the car that had um one of the suspect's fingerprints on it so it was pretty easy to find them because the car was found on chipman street where the, the suspect one of the suspects lived yes so um they found find her body she is fetal position she's been hog tied yep in and put into five trash bags mm-hmm. and then also stuffed in like a kitchen trash can like a like, rubber made yeah with the sealed trash can. yeah like not not large not the ones right. you have outside your house just the small ones um and she had chemical burns and injuries all over her mouth all over her body um had chemical burns in the genital area where they had that well they actually put bleach down her throat mm-hmm. um and then scrubbed her genital area with bleach as well to try to get rid of it, any evidence dna evidence mm-hmm. um she had been tied up like you said raped for 24 hours 20 bore whole hours tortured for 24 hours and she was actually put in those bags and in the trash can alive alive her matter of death was suffocation because of the way her body was compressed and that you know the trash bags and lack of oxygen lack of oxygen it could have taken her up to an hour yeah um i think one of the most gruesome details of this was that she died with her eyes open Mm -hmm. that's how she was found and that is just so wrong Uh, i was watching some of the trial because knox news did a great job on this mm -hmm. they were able to get into the courtroom and so i got to watch a ton of um you know testimony and it was incredible and i heard a lot about just the fact that like one of the lawyers passed out seeing some of the photos, photos. of the evidence yeah i can't, I can't imagine out. like and I, well, one thing that i wanted to mention is both families were at every single trial of all five suspects yeah every single one all the hearings every single that's thing. like going through trauma after trauma after trauma after for trauma. years for years yeah that's <sighs> They're very strong people. Yes, they are. And if you, we should link some of the the videos we've watched and the trial we've seen just because it's so compelling to me. It's so compelling. So let's go over the suspects. There are five people in this case. Um, LaMarcus Davidson, who is, this is where the... Crime took place mm-hmm. in his home uh, on Chipman Street. Then his half brother, Latalvis Cobbins, mm-hmm. Latalvis and his friend George Thomas were in Knoxville to visit for New Year's. Yes. Including Latalvis Cobbins' girlfriend, Vanessa Coleman. So Latalvis, George, and Vanessa are from Kentucky. Um, and then there's Eric Boyd, who is Lamarcus's. Friend. So yep. just to recap that, LaMarcus and LaTalvis are brothers. George Thomas is LaTalvis's friend. Vanessa Coleman is LaTalvis's girlfriend. And Eric Boyd is LaMarcus's friend. friend. Yep. So all five were charged with several counts. Um, they were able to, when they found the car with the envelope and the fingerprints, immediately were able to pin it to Latalvis Cobbins. Yes. And that's how the whole thing started. Yeah. Um, I will say, too, just from listening to some of the the testimony from Latalvis, he, the three of them, him, Vanessa, and George, were visiting LaMarcus for New Year's. 
and he mentions that he hadn't seen his brother very much because his brother had been in prison and locked up for a good while Mm -hmm. for a previous carjacking yes they were known carjackers um and known drug dealers I watched um, some testimony. It was like a defense for Latalvis. Uh, it was by Latalvis and Lamarcus's sister, Misha. Um, and she was kind of just describing like what their life was like. They're both pretty, you know, young, 20s, 30s, early. And so Misha was first born. Um, her mom was pregnant at like 13, had her at 14. Then came Lamarcus and then came Latalvis. And by the time she was 17, she had three kids and she had an addiction problem. Mm -hmm. Um, So their home life was incredibly unstable, moving all the time, sometimes not having a place to stay, getting evicted, things being thrown out of their house. Like she was high. Yeah. Criminal activity for just to provide, like just to get money for food, Mm -hmm. things like that. I mean, they're, they're kids with the, the only option being, crime yeah to eat so by no means an easy bring up Mm -hmm. um with that said um the evidence yeah so the evidence shows that lamarcus was the ringleader of this he's the one who has the biggest rap sheet according to his sister uh latalvis was more the secondary like the secondary guy like the guy who kind of just did whatever he said right um i think most definitely trying to seeking approval Mm -hmm. and thinking if he's doing it it's cool or it's okay or i have to do it or he needs me to do this Mm -hmm. it's my brother um i don't think by any means though he ever once thought like truly thought like I shouldn't do this yeah or this is terrible what's going on and he has a 40 there's a 40 minute testimony about what happened in his own words and what happened as he went throughout the night um he kind of admits that LaMarcus was the ringleader he kind of coaxed him out to like look at this girl and yeah. it ended up in a Let's car this girl. yeah then they bring him back to the house and and mark talvis is like i don't want to do this anymore i don't want to do this and um he testified that like he would like take her some water or check on the victims or tie them up he had a lot of involvement in it and a lot of opportunity to stop yeah to do the right thing exactly at any given point, like even if you he had already done something wrong, there were still opportunities where he could have put mm-hmm. an end to all of this. Yeah. So evidence. We started off with the envelope, which tied the which, talbis. Yeah, it was found in her car and had um, fingerprints on it. Mm-hmm. And those same fingerprints were mm-hmm. found on the trash bags. Yeah, uh, Latalvis's fingerprints were found on the envelope in the car, and then Lamarcus's fingerprints were found on the trash bags that were found with Shannon, and also the box of trash bags that was under the sink in the kitchen. Yeah, so and then direct evidence. There was also inside the house was like all their um, stuff. Chris's driver's license, um, pictures, and things that Shannon had in her car were found in the house, like a a bunch of stuff that was in her car or on their person was found in the house. Um, His hat that he always wore. His baseball hat. Yeah, just Um, so much evidence. And DNA was found on her by LaMarcus, LaTalvis, George, and Eric. Um, They And on her clothes. Yeah, all over her clothes. Her body, inside of her body, and on her clothes everywhere yeah everywhere um and then latalvis cobbins dna was also found on shannon Mm -hmm. now they think that eric boyd is the one 
who did stuff to Chris. Yeah, um, they believe Chris was raped as well. There was trauma. Um, yeah, to the the remains, and but they weren't able to get DNA evidence from his body because of the chemical burns and the damage that that had done. So they tried to cover up his body with burning him essentially. Yeah. And um, they did find semen and and DNA, but it wasn't good enough to be tested. It was too damaged. Right. And be put towards anyone. Um, But he is, Eric Boyd is believed to be the one who, attacked Chris Chris. and possibly raped him. Mm -hmm. Um, And all the while, Vanessa Coleman, who is Talvis's girlfriend, girlfriend. she's just there. This all happened within a 24-hour period. She wasn't there for the carjacking, but she was in the Chipman Street house the whole time. Yeah. Knew what was going on. This is a very small house. There's two bedrooms that have a Jack and Jill uh, Bathroom. bathroom. Very small house. She knew what was going on. And she was left alone several occasions where she could have done something. Yeah, called somebody or let them go Mm -hmm. or anything. Um, She actually, they found a journal entry of hers that to me is just so. Damning. Yes. And also so inhumane. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, again. I will never understand. Yeah. I don't know how a human being can think this way, but it's it's very immature. It's very insensitive. It's very, it lacks any sort of humanity to me. Mm-hmm. With It doesn't necessarily go into detail or gruesome details or anything like that, but almost like, she just keeps saying, like, what an adventure. Mm-hmm. What a wild ride. Being in Tennessee has been crazy. Mm-hmm. It's been such an adventure. I hope your life has been as adventurous as mine. Things like that. Yeah. Just very um, desensitized mm-hmm. to what has gone. human beings at all. Yeah. Like, very odd. Yeah. Very odd. Very odd. Um, and cold. Yes. Oh, that's how I would describe it. It's just cold. It's like she want. It was almost like she wanted to brag about yeah. it, but she knew better than to write to it write down. it down. Mm-hmm. Or like she wanted to people to be like, "Oh my god, that's cool," mm-hmm. or "Oh my god, you that's crazy. How awesome!" Mm-hmm. Which is so Mm-mm. not cool. Disgusting. It is disgusting. Uh, it's disgusting. So lots of evidence, obviously, stacked on these people. Mm-hmm. Um, LaMarcus Davidson is sentenced to life. He was the ringleader. He had the most charges to begin with and the most like DNA and evidence. LaMarcus Davidson, Latalvis Cobbins, and George Thomas had 46 charges in all. Yes. Between carjacking, robbery, um, you know. Trying to get rid of DNA. Yes. Being accessory. Obstruction. Be rape. Torture. Yes kidnapping 46 counts so sodomizing yeah. all the a lot everything they should have been charged with mm-hmm. and all three of them got life so i would like to add that all five of these people are still in jail as of today right now yep in 2023 which is which makes me feel really good me too the the um prosecutor on this case the da for knoxville fantastic she mm-hmm. did a wonderful job yes she did a great job even just watching like clips from trials mm-hmm. and testimonies and stuff i was mm-hmm. like good job yeah she was really way to go she, yeah she did a great job mm-hmm. um eric boyd who was a part of it he got 18 years and vanessa was originally charged with 53 years her um dna and fingerprints were on the scene and they couldn't ever decide what amount of involvement she had in it but she was originally sentenced to 53 years it was reduced to 35 years um because another part of this case is um judge richard bumgardner well i was gonna say too eric boyd the friend of the marcus he was basically aiding and abetting and housing the suspects trying to like keep them from 
being arrested. Right. So you I think that was evidence. one of his. Yeah, I think the. I don't know. Is he one of the ones that talked that kind of snitched a little bit to get a lesser sentence in the beginning? It was either Eric or George that did that. One of the, I think it was George that flipped on him. I'm yep. not sure, but nevertheless, it's yeah. uh, relevant. He was actually keeping them at his house. Eric was keeping them at his house, and I'm mm-hmm. just like, that's dumb. What kind of company th- do these people keep? We've learned that all these criminals are so stupid. They are so stupid. Like, so dumb. <sighs> Man. Why didn't they think they were going to get caught? They're de- They're... Even if you try and get rid of DNA, that's almost impossible. Yes. And your fingerprints off of some, like, it's in the system. Yeah. All they got to do is check. And They it, just put it on their computer and your name pops up. It's that I easy. don't understand. It's so, they're just dumb. So anyway, um, the, judge. the judge in this case. This Richard is a Bumgarner. whole different avenue right now. Yeah. This is, this is the. I know we've had our our speculations about the lead detective in the Angel Bumpus case, mm-hmm. but we really have not had an avenue like this that's like one lane highway sidetracked to the actual case. Mm-hmm. So I, I find this to be very interesting. Um, he was on drugs. He was on like so many drugs being prescribed by like uh, tons, of doctors. tons of doctors, veterinarians, um, getting it off people. Like he was high as a kite. He had been prescribed. This is just prescribed. This, we don't know the number of how many pills and drugs that he got like from people and off the streets. Mm-hmm. You know, like we have no idea that number, but he was prescribed over 2,000 pain pills in one year by, oh, like, a crazy number of physicians. Mm-hmm. It was, like, between 10 and 20 physicians across the board. That is insane. And honestly, if you go back and watch some of the trial mm-hmm. and um, excerpts from the trial, in my opinion, it's ve- – I remember thinking – he seems off before I knew about like what actually happened. Yeah, just looks real tired, like just lethargic. checked out. Yeah, spacey. Yeah, I mean, a drug addict. He yeah. look looks like a drug Someone in and addicted. out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, because um, all of this comes out and is proven, a lot of the cases that he oversaw as the judge were basically had to be retried Mm -hmm. and a lot of like a lot of cases cases. and this case being one of them so all five suspects their cases all had to be retried which is just awful for the family yeah yeah i mean how much can they take how Mm. much can they take I don't wish it on anybody, but these people have a different kind of strength. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Because they've also stayed. They're such good people. They've stayed vigilant on getting different laws passed. So some of these things don't happen. And, you know, just setting, keeping their kids' names alive, keeping Mm -hmm. their family and friends. The legacy, creating legacies for young people. Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes when we lose people that are so young, it's, it's easy for people around them to forget Mm -hmm. and to, you know, as their friends move on with their lives and this and that and the other, but they've really kept them like the centerfold of like all the greatness that Mm -hmm. they're doing, which I say it again, these people have a different kind of strength. Yeah. They but do. they've also just maintained, like, they're still good people. Do you know how hard it would be to really believe in humanity after something like this? Yeah. And then having to go back to court and back to court for new trials, new hearings, mm-hmm. after you learn the judge has screwed up everything? Mm-hmm. Like, how, 
the fact that they still believe in human beings at all blows my mind. Yeah. But also believe in them enough to actually like pay it forward and like do something Mm -hmm. positive with it is just amazing. Yeah, the Christian family and the Newsom family have done so much for Shannon and for Chris. Um, They've done, you know, fundraisers to help other kids looking to go to University of Knoxville. Yeah. They've done acts in their names. Mm -hmm. Um, So just really great things, which makes me really happy. Shannon's family, um, Shannon's family has the Shannon Christian Foundation. Sorry, let me pull it up on a tab. Um, the Shannon Gell Christian Foundation. Mm-hmm. Every year they do a golf tournament. Um, and with the money raised by the charity golf tournament, they award one female student from Farragut High School a college scholarship for a student atten- that's attending the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, mm-hmm. which is awesome. That's amazing. That's right up your alley. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, Chris Newsom's family have uh, a Little League Baseball tournament in his name. Um, there's this cute little plaque on the Hall High School baseball stadium uh, that says safe at home mm-hmm. and with his name. And um, they also give that money to scholarships for kids coming out of Hall High School and looking at baseball and stuff like that. I just love that because all these young people get to see their names in a good light, Mm -hmm. like in a positive light, Mm -hmm. not in as who they are as people, not what happened to them, which I think is amazing. It's profound. Um, And then they have also both families um, basically spearheaded um different things so that there are laws and acts in place that um support and help victims families in the future Mm -hmm. so chris newsome the chris newsome act basically makes it to where there is not a you don't need a judge's signature for a unanimous guilty verdict from a jury Um, It's also known as the 13th juror. Mm -hmm. So that eliminates that. Yeah. It eliminates like the, that step that can be grueling for families when they have to then wait on another thing to happen or wait on a judge to approve a verdict, stuff like that. It just, it really supports the families of the victims and the people that are having to go through this whole trial process. And I think a lot of that had to do with the judge in this case because, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was all overturned because he signed this thing. Yep. And and now that's eliminated. With a unanimous jury, Mm -hmm. they don't have to. If a judge is um, being unprofessional and not upholding what what they swore to do, it won't affect a case where a unanimous jury said guilty or not guilty exactly exactly and then the shannon christian act restricts attorneys from portraying a victim in a negative light i think this is a huge huge law and thank goodness it's in um it's in the law books today because they tried to this case had a lot to do with um race because the victims were white white and the suspects were black and so in media they tried to make that a, things make that a thing um they also kind of tried to portray um chris and shannon as like maybe drug users um uh, she had a little bit of alcohol in her system or like and and some sort of like promiscuous behavior almost as if almost like the like the victims blaming yeah and like they like they put themselves in that situation and they asked for it, yeah. things like that. Um, and one of the things that stuck out to me as far as this, this act being put in place was her parents had to sit there and listen to the people that did this to her as well as the defense make up lies and rumors about their daughter but 
all the while, the the prosecution was not allowed to bring up um, the older brother, like his previous carjacking, what mm-hmm. he had been in prison for. None of that was allowed to be brought up, but they could make up the stuff about her and Chris. And like, as a parent, if I had to sit there and listen, like, how do you not lose your mind? I would have been like one of those people who lost it. You yeah. Know, you see like videos of someone going after the defendant and it. No, it, that would I would be lose me. my mind. I would lose all control of 100%. The rage I think would take over. Yep. And the fact that these parents didn't, I mean, Shannon's dad, you can see it written all over his face. He is trying to self soothe. Yeah. Has I feel so like you much could rage. see internally he is, like, about to boil over. And that takes a lot of strength to keep it together like that. And he did that. I just keep thinking about how amazing Chris and Shannon must have been as people because I feel like their family and friends throughout this whole process really went into, like, Chris and Shannon mode. Like, I'm a good person. I can keep myself under control. hmm I'm going to be a good person today. Yeah. I'm not going to lose my mind. Yeah. Um, I, I can't imagine. I can't either. But like you said, all five perpetrators, murderers, are still in prison mm-hmm. throughout the whole crazy trial process and then the retrial of everything. And I feel like justice won in this case. I think so too. And that's... That's at least the most pleasant ending for something this terrible. But there are too many cases where justice doesn't get win. Yeah. Right. So there is. So there is a, a, it's like ending on a good note and ending on, you know, the new acts and laws that are put into place because of Chris and Shannon and the new foundations that are going to help other young people that were interested in the things that they were interested in. It's just mm-hmm. uh, go to school chills. and, and get a chance to mm-hmm. to do all the things that Chris and Shannon were doing and wanted to do. Um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to take away from the foundations, and I feel like we can try to like add tags mm-hmm. to the video and stuff, so that if you want to, if you want to go play in the golf tournament, or if you've got a little league baseball or softball team that wants to be in that tournament. Um, we definitely want to try and moving forward, um, support the victims, families and their foundations and all the good they're trying to do because it's, I can't imagine how difficult it is to keep your mind on good things after such a bad thing happens. Mm -hmm. It takes special people to do that. So Mm -hmm. I have chills. I know. Mm. Well, to the victims, family um all the respect is Mm -hmm. due to you i just feel like saying that again just because um you know i feel connected to them when we do this yeah it's almost like keeping their child their memory their you know their love alive yep and yeah it's just and i think too when we talk about the victims and their families like in any case in any situation but especially in this one because they're young people that are college age living a normal life um i think it goes without saying again it can happen to anyone um but be prepared and look out look, look around know your surroundings and do whatever you can to be prepared so that if something god forbid something like this happens or there's someone around that wants to harm you you can hopefully prevent it yeah just be vigilant yes be aware of your surroundings when you are alone yep um you know have some some kind of protection whether that is like mace mace, like the little mace can or i have a keychain that if you pull the um tab it makes a A really loud noise yeah i've seen um you know keychains where they have like you know knives connected to them or you know protection Mm -hmm. pepper spray tasers guns like the seat belt seat belt cutter things um the window the thing that you like hit the window and it mm-hmm. shatters, just stuff like that. Um, just be safe. 
yeah be be safe and know your surroundings and always like i don't feel like i should ever be somewhere and no one knows where i am exactly you know like i have like five people who have my location on at yeah, all times yes if i'm going somewhere new someone has the address mm -hmm. and know oh what's no yeah going on. my parents like i'm married and me and my husband do this but my parents and taylor's parents are still like okay what's the address mm -hmm. what's the phone number when are you supposed to get there mm -hmm. and just just be that way I, it yes. sucks that the world has come to this but i would rather better be safe than sorry safe than sorry yeah mm -hmm. All right, well, until next time, it's the expired podcast.